I, in a million years that I'd be standing here in front of a church doing this. Um, I became a Christian. I was a CPA. I was a bean counter like Merle, right? <laughs> Counting my beans, debits and credits, right? Making sure they all balance. Um, I was the chief financial officer. I was the chief operating officer of a company. And uh, I was getting involved in my local church, and I was very involved in the local community, um, working for not only my church, but helping with some nonprofits. And uh, the thought of being a pastor someday was like the most remote thought I could ever imagine. Like, there is no way. I was 30-something. I was deep into my career. I mean, really deep into my career, and um, I was really kind of in my sweet spot, just like Merle just zips those financial statements out, right? I just, uh, it was just my thing. I was just like God had equipped me and, and made me for that. And I was confident when God brought me to faith in Jesus Christ that he, he brought me so that I could bring, you know, most of the people I worked with who were not Christians to faith in Jesus Christ, that I'd be able to, to go there and, and tell them about the gospel um, as well. Um, but God led me. God spoke to me. God told me that this isn't what I should be doing. And yes, I really mean I heard from God that this is not what I should be doing, but that I should be going into pastoral ministry. God led me in that direction, and God still leads me today. So when someone comes up to me and says, God told me, blah, 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 or um, I know that, that God wants me to X, Y, Z, or sometimes people come to me and say, Pastor, God told me to tell you blah, 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 and I won't fill in all the blanks, but when I hear that, I have to admit that I am very skeptical when I hear that. When someone comes to me and says that God told me, um, or um, I, I hear God telling me, um, immediately I, I like stop, and, and I confess to being skeptical sometimes. Even though I feel like I heard from God that I should be a pastor and not be doing all this other stuff that I was doing. And, and the reason why I'm so skeptical is there have been so many times when someone's come to me and said, I heard God tell me, blah, 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 and clearly God didn't tell them that because that never happened. Or um, I can remember a time we had some folks uh, come to the church and they stood up and they said, God is going to send you a youth pastor and your budget's gonna pay for it and it's gonna happen in the next year. That was three years ago. And lots of times, people say that God has told them to do something that we know that God forbids we do. And so yes, sometimes I'm skeptical. So how do you know? How do you know? How do you discern if God is indeed leading you in one direction or if God is leading you in another direction? And is it? that God only speaks to some people and God doesn't speak to other people? Is that what it is? And if God does speak to you in some way, how does God lead you through your Christian walk? How does that happen? Well, this week's passage in the book of Acts, we're going through the book of Acts as a church, this week's passage provides us with an answer to these questions, I believe. So let's look at the passage. It's Acts chapter 16, verses one through 24. Um, if you want to pick up a pew Bible in front of you, um, you may. It's page 870 in the regular pew Bibles. It's page 1099 in the, in the large print Bibles, the bigger Bibles. And uh, we're going to put it up. Austin's going to put it up on the screen for you like he does every day, not just his birthday. Um, <laughs> Acts chapter 16, verses 1 through 24. Hear now God's word. Paul also came to Derby and to Lystra, a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. 
So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go out, uh, to, to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So setting sail for Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace and the following day to Neapolis. And from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and, the Roman, and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the woman who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her whole household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us crying, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I commend you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her and it came out that very hour. And when her owners saw that their hope and gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disrupting our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in, attacking them, and the magistrates tore their garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our minds to understand, our hearts to receive the good news that you have for us here this morning. Speak clearly to us through this word. Help us to be not only receivers of the word, but doers of the word and doers of your will. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So there's one thing I want you to see in this passage, one thing, that God leads all of us in our Christian walk. Not that God just leads some of us in our Christian walk, not just a few of us, not just pastors, not just church leaders, not just those who have certain spiritual gifts, but God leads all of us, every Christian in their Christian walk. And I'm gonna show you five ways that God leads us. The first, that God leads us through closed and open doors. God leads us first through closed and open doors. When I got my call to pastoral ministry, it wasn't because I was seeking it out. It wasn't because I had this plan where I'm gonna be a pastor someday. Now that I became a Christian, like this is the higher calling. I didn't have that thought at all. In fact, I realized that there is no higher calling, a calling we all are equally called to different spheres. I wasn't seeking it out, it wasn't on my radar. And, and when others started suggesting it, I, I, I didn't even think that pastoral ministry was something God could possibly want me to do. I, I ignored people that told me that at first. And it's that way a lot of the places that God calls us. We don't really think that that could be where God is calling us. And we see that with Timothy. We read in verse one that Timothy was a disciple of Jesus Christ. He was a follower of Jesus. He was someone who was learning the way of Christ. He was trusting in Jesus. We know that his mom was a Jewish believer and that his dad was a Greek non-believer. 
We know that Timothy was well educated in the faith. Um, we hear this in 2 Timothy chapter 1 by his believing mother and by his believing grandmother. So, mothers and grandmothers, you don't think you have influence on your children? Let me tell you, there's a lot of influence. Timothy. And it appears that they were led to the Christian faith from their Jewish faith by realizing that Jesus was the Messiah that, that their faith looked forward to. We also see in verse two that Timothy was a man well spoken of by those around him. In other words, he had exemplary character. Not only did he know his faith well, but he was someone that was spoken well of. And so Paul determined when he, when he saw Timothy that Timothy would be a good co-laborer to go with him and to go with Silas, the other missionary, as they were going on this missionary journey. This wasn't from all accounts, especially as we read First and Second Timothy and see how poor equipped that Paul seemed to think Timothy thought he was, that this isn't something that Timothy anticipated. But God, all of a sudden, it opened a door. And the next thing you know, Paul is using Timothy as a missionary, he's strengthening churches all over the Roman Empire as we see in Acts and we see in the book of 1 Timothy as we see in the book of First and, uh, Second Timothy and, and elsewhere in the New Testament where Timothy's mentioned. Timothy wasn't seeking this out, it appears, but this was something that Paul identified in him. He, he saw that this man was called to ministry and Timothy accepted the call. He walked into the open door. Well, Lest you think that God just leads us through open doors, God leads us by closing doors as well. Sometimes he he closes them to lead us where we're supposed to go. We read in verse six, and they went through the region of Phrygia and and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. We're not told exactly how, but all of a sudden there's one door closed on him, another door closed on him, and they can't go to the places that they were planning to go. Again, we don't know how that happened. Was it the audible voice of God? Maybe, it doesn't tell us that. Did they have a certain amount of peace that was withdrawn from them, that they were sensing maybe that this was God's leading? Um, was there transportation issues? They couldn't get there somehow. Um, the, you know, the weather was permitting them, uh, Uh, keeping them from going. Sickness, we're not told. All we're told is that they were blocked from going. And God prevents us from doing things in a whole bunch of ways. But the one thing I know, God doesn't close doors to discourage us. That's not why doors close on us, to discourage us. Maybe discourage us from doing something that would really be bad for us. But God closes doors to lead us in the way we should walk. We see two closed doors, and then they're followed by an open door. Verse nine, God sent a vision to Paul telling him, guess what, you're not going there, but you're going to Macedonia instead. Sometimes doors close and sometimes doors open. And our job is to continue being faithful where God's placed us until that next door is opened. And sometimes we don't like that. Sometimes we go, you know, we think we're the SWAT team and we go kicking in the doors, right? That's about as high as I can kick, don't worry. <laughs> right? But, but sometimes we think we gotta just keep banging and banging and banging on that door, get frustrated that door's not opening. Sometimes we pray one direction. We pray for a certain time frame. And we think, God, are you listening? I've been praying. Don't you care? When in fact, God is leading us in a different direction. We're not accepting that God is leading us in a different direction. He's not leading us the way we want to go or the way we think he's leading us, but obviously he's closed the door for a particular reason. And as difficult as it is, we need to trust him. We need to accept it. Our church has been on a revitalization. We're kind of out of re- revitalization phase now, but we started a revitalization about four years ago. And one of the very first things we did when we met before maybe we were even officially in agreeing to a revitalization, was to start something called soup and prayer. And we ended up putting signs, these, these sign boards um, down on the street where you see the signs uh, this morning coming in. And it said, soup and prayer, free, six o'clock. And we put it up every Thursday. And we agreed, if one person shows up, we're gonna be here, it doesn't matter. How many people show up, we're gonna be there for, for soup and prayer. We'll put the sign out, we'll have the free soup, and we'll see who shows up. Well, the first couple of months, basically all 12 to 15 people that were in our church at the time showed up. 
We all came, it was a great time of fellowship. We weren't reaching a person, but we were having a great time in fellowship together. And then eventually, one at a time, people started coming, and another person would come, and they would come for soup and prayer, right? Michelle was one of those people. There are a number of people who came to our church for soup and prayer, some people who had never been to a church, some people who had only been to a church a few times. And several of them came to faith in Jesus Christ. And several of them are members in our church now. And that went on like that for a couple of years. We had a really good run. We had a lot of people showing up. We might have had you know, 15, 20 people every week pretty consistently showing up for soup and prayer. And then a couple of years in, it started doing this and fewer and fewer people coming. And I started getting a little frustrated. I'm like, why doesn't anyone come to soup and prayer? Like, why aren't people coming anymore? What is happening with soup and prayer? It was like the greatest thing. Like, this is clearly God's will that we would reach people, invite them in, give them a free meal, tell them about Jesus. But the numbers kept dwindling down. And so we ended up shutting it down. We ended up stopped doing it. About the same time, we really felt that God was leading us to do um, an outreach to our homeless neighbors. We have a ministry to people who are homeless in our neighborhood, and we thought God's gonna lead us to, to do a worship service for them. It's a way to, to go out to them, and maybe they'll, they'll come to us. And we were gonna do that Sundays after we finished up here. We were gonna go out, and a bunch of us were gonna go out. And uh, Doug, who was part of our church, who lives in Tennessee, was very involved in that, and, and we got a grant to, to pay for it so that we could do it and get the equipment we needed and all that, and surely God's gonna do that. But then, all of a sudden, the post office wouldn't let us use their property. And then the airport kind of let us on, and you know, not intentionally, but you know, they kind of said, oh, I think we're gonna be able to do it, and then we get to the airport commission, and they're like, not using our property for that. And I understand the reasons why, but I couldn't understand why God shut it down. Another closed door. And so we sat in the back office there, it was a few of us, and it was Doug, and I think Christy, and maybe Steph, and Pat, and we just sat down and we prayed, God, like, what are you gonna have us do? And we opened, that opened the door on a Thursday night community dinner. And that Thursday night community dinner this past week had about 42, 44 people there, many of whom are homeless. And, and so he closed two doors and opened another door and had us accomplish the outreach to all our neighbors who are homeless and, and others as well. And if you haven't been to Thursday night, you gotta come to Thursday night. And, and it turned out being a better fellowship than we could have ever imagined in any other way. God both restrains and prompts, he permits and he prevents. Opening doors and closing doors is one of the ways that God leads us. He also leads us through counsel. God leads us through counsel. The more I grow in my faith, the more I realize my need to stop making snap decisions, to just you know, be so impulsive to decide that we need to do this quickly and to seek the counsel of others before deciding anything big. If you think about it, that might think, oh man, that's gonna slow things down if you have to start asking other people, do you think this is a good idea? Do we need to pray about it, right? But, but you guys seek counsel all the time for like the most minuscule of things. You know, Yelp has a whole business <laughs> that's about seeking counsel, like do I go to this restaurant or not, right? What do the reviews say? How many stars does it have? How many times do you go on Amazon and buy something if it has three stars, two stars, one stars, right? Never, does, does that even sell? I don't know. But we seek the counsel of other things, right? And so why wouldn't we in big things that are of God seek the counsel of others within the body of Christ before we make major decisions? It's more critical when we're discerning God's will and leading in our lives, which is what we see Paul doing after receiving a vision, verse nine. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. He's having a dream. A vision appeared to him in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Seems pretty clear, right? Paul had a dream. Come to Macedonia. Help them preach you know, the good news about Jesus there. But how does Paul know it isn't just some random dream? How does he know? Right? Have you ever, if I ever told you about some of the dreams I have, Right, we have the most bizarre dreams sometimes. We get in that REM sleep and next thing you know, we're dreaming the craziest things. If I acted on every dream I had, who knows? Well, the way he knew is in the next verse, verse 10. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on 
into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Right, there's a we in the decision making process. It doesn't say Paul decided, it says we decided, we concluded, we sought. And this is the author, we believe, of the book of Acts, which is Luke, that is now joining Paul on the journey. It was, it was Paul and it was Timothy and it was, it was Silas and it was Luke. As, as Paul relates the vision to them, they all in verse 10 concluded that it was God calling them to, to, to preach the good news about Jesus to the Macedonians rather than to go where they intentionally intended to go and were blocked. Understanding what God wants us to do sometimes involves the counsel of other believers, right? Not on our own. Sometimes it's, it's God's word. It's pe- putting the pieces of the puzzle together. It's not just having a dream or, or I had this idea and going, but it's thinking about it. It's putting the pieces together. It's gathering information, drawing a conclusion. They didn't simply decide to go because Paul had a vision that they should go. They discerned together that that this is where God was leading them and then they immediately went. Now weighing whether something is God's will or not, we should always first consider God's word. If Paul's vision encouraged something God's word forbid, well they probably shouldn't do it and many times that happens. It could have been some bad hummus before he went to bed or something. Never want to seek God's will apart from the counsel of his word and apart from other counsel. Christians, that's one of the surest ways to know that God's leading you. The third way is that God leads us as we go. God leads us as we go. I'm a planner, no surprise, right? I'm a planner, like I have the 2024 preaching calendar. I already sent it out, it's already planned out. I know every week what I'm gonna preach. I know, just, I'm a nut. I used to plan out every meal I was going to eat when I was a competitive cyclist. I used to, every day I would figure out for the next week, every piece of food I'm going to eat. And I still think about, what am I going to eat for dinner tonight? For Austin's birthday. (laughs) When I was about 19, I started realizing, I, I read all these things, like if you start when you're young and you start investing your money for retirement now, you're going to be a gajillionaire by the time you're 65. Right? That's true assuming everything works out and there's not some tank in the economy. And I headed down that road, started putting money away for retirement every single week, like out of my paycheck, so much is going into a 401k or, or whatever retirement vehicle it was, or in the bank. And I kept going down that road for a very, very long time. I'm slightly older than 19 now. And today, I'm proud to tell you that I don't have a dollar saved for retirement. Why? Because I believe that's what God told me to do with my money. Whose money was it anyway? It wasn't mine, it was God's money. You and I are just stewards of everything God's given us. God always provides what we need and he leads us as we go. Now, someone's gonna say, Pastor, should we just like tank our our 401ks? Like throw all our money out? I'm not saying, I'm not telling you not to save for retirement. But you gotta ask yourself, how is God leading me in my Christian walk? Am I saving up treasure for earth or for heaven? And what is retirement anyway? And what does planning for it look like? And how much do you set in stone? Well, if you've been following the missionary's trip as I just read it, they haven't been following the plan, have they? They veered off the plan that they set out from. But they were sent out by their home church in Antioch and what they were supposed to do was go back to all the places that they had been to on the first missionary journey. They were gonna kind of do it backwards and go around and, and check on the churches and see how they're doing that. It was a much simpler plan. It was a really good plan actually to build up all the people there, right? a God-honoring plan. But once they got along on the trip, the Lord began to tweak the plan, didn't he? Began to enhance the plan, began to shift it a little bit. And they must have been confused. Why would God modify such a great plan? I mean, we had like the best plan, they thought. It honored God. It did everything God told us to do. What in the world is he doing? You've heard that saying, right? If you want to hear God laugh, just tell him your plans. I feel like that's my life story, God laughing at my plans. I'm guessing many of you experience the same sort of thing. There are times when you're feeling like you're going nowhere. 
You ever feel like that? Like you're going nowhere? As if you're treading water and the plans you've been praying for haven't been realized yet or haven't played out on your time schedule? It's like, what in the world, God? But here's the thing, the Lord often moves us at his pace. He reveals his plan as we step forward in faith. You know, I don't know about you, I haven't seen the 20-year plan from God yet or the 10-year plan or the five-year plan or the one-year, I haven't even seen the plan for tomorrow yet, honestly. That's the way of our Christian walk. It's trusting God as we walk, trusting his faithfulness. Tim Keller says, it's often like a mountainous road on which you often labor hard, doubling back and seeming to get nowhere until you come to some vantage point where you can see the big picture and see how much progress you've made and where you're going. I love that. It's one thing to trust God's leading you when you can see where you're going. It's another thing when you don't have a clue where he's taking you, when you can't see that big picture. But we know that God will never leave us. God will never forsake us. And God has a plan for every one of your lives. The fourth way God lead, leads us is kind of obvious. He, God leads our faith in Jesus. God leads our faith in Jesus. I love the mission of God. God is on a quest to redeem a people for himself. And he's creating a bride for Jesus in all of us, right, through faith in Jesus. We've all been separated from God by our sin. We've sealed our eternal fate. But Jesus has redeemed us out of it. He paid the penalty of our sin on the cross and he rose from the dead, overcoming sin and death. And now God set apart those who were redeemed in Christ, like Luke, like Paul, like Silas, like Timothy, like us, to bring others into the kingdom of God through faith in the good news about Jesus. And all through the book of Acts, we keep seeing as they bring the good news about Jesus, as they tell people the good news about Jesus, what happens? People are coming to faith all over the place. We talked about the book of Acts. It's not really the Acts of the Apostles. It's the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the people of God. Acts 16.5, so churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. God led those missionaries into their callings and that's the result, more are redeemed for God. The kingdom of God expands. And so it is all along the detour. We read of a, health, a wealthy woman by the name of Lydia. I wish I had more time to talk about Lydia, but we read in verse 14 that her heart was opened. God opened Lydia's heart to receive the good news about Jesus, which Paul told her. We can't just think that people are gonna get the good news without telling them. Paul told her, she received it because God changed her heart. Here's a wealthy woman. Here's a woman of notoriety. She's leading this, this prayer meeting in a place where there couldn't be a temple because there were not enough Jewish men. To, and she's leading this prayer meeting, this wealthy woman of much notoriety. And we're told in the passage that she's looking for something more. We're told, and then God led Paul to her and led her into faith in Christ, along with her whole household. Her prayers were answered, and God led her on the way. I gotta kinda cut this short, because we're going long, but I wanna talk to anyone here who's a non-Christian, and I normally don't do this. Don't raise your hand if you're not trusting in Jesus. We're not trying to out you. But I wanna talk to the non-Christians who think right now that there has to be more to your life. Have you considered that God may have led you today to this place to hear me tell you this good news about Jesus or someone else tell you this good news about Jesus that you might become part of the redeemed of God and find that something more that you've been looking for? Is God right now, like Lydia, opening your heart to faith in Jesus Christ? And for the rest of you who already know Jesus Christ, there are lots of Lydias out there who we need to bring this good news of Jesus to. Who are the Lydia's in your life that need to know about Jesus? All right, the final way that God leads us, he leads our spiritual battles. God leads our spiritual battles. So Paul and and the other missionaries, 
they were invited to stay for a few days by Lydia and they're going back to the prayer meeting. This is the place where they looked at the word of God, they, they prayed together. And as they're on the way, that we see in verse 18 that they are, or as verse 16, that they're intercepted by a demon-possessed slave girl. So here's this woman, she's got two things against her. She's enslaved and she's demon-possessed. And this girl tags along with Paul and the other missionaries. We see in verse 18, for many days. It wasn't just a brief interruption. She keeps tagging along with him. And she seems to be aligning herself with, with Paul's mission. Luke reports, for, for, Luke reports verse 17, she followed Paul and us crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Satan is trying to derail Paul's mission by appearing to form an alliance with Paul through this demon-possessed woman. You think, what's so bad about this? But here's this demon-possessed woman from the world of darkness trying to align herself with Paul for their own evil purposes. And after verse 18, becoming greatly annoyed with the deception, Paul commands the demon to come out of the poor slave girl in the name of Jesus Christ, and it does, in the power of Jesus Christ. And the girl is rescued, and the missionary's testimony and witness to Jesus is upheld before a whole city. This woman says who they found their hope in, the passage says, is totally redeemed, taken out of darkness by the power of Jesus before an entire city. God has led and given them victory in the spiritual battle in a place where the powers of darkness had just been unleashed and going strong for who knows how long. That's what the power of Jesus can do. Don't underestimate the power of Jesus in your own life. To change your own heart to trust in him. To tell other people about Jesus. We say we're gonna go out and we're gonna share the gospel with other people, the good news about Jesus. When we say we're gonna share the gospel, and I say that and I'm gonna stop saying that because when we say we're gonna share the gospel, it sounds like, oh, I'm just gonna go out and just share with them the gospel about, you know, these, these are people who are gonna be receptive to it. They weren't usually telling the gospel to people who were receptive. It never says anywhere in the Bible that they shared the gospel. It says they preached the gospel, they proclaimed the gospel, they told about the gospel. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. And many of you are a testimony to that power. See, this isn't just a story about Luke or a story about Paul or a story about Silas or this isn't a story about just Timothy. This is a story about how God leads us all through our Christian walk. You're gonna see at the end of this passage, which we're not gonna talk about this week, that, that the missionaries' um, situation, their circumstances are about to get flipped upside down again. They're gonna be put in jail. They're gonna be put in the inner prison. They're gonna be held in stocks. Doesn't sound a lot of fun. All because what? Because the power of Jesus, because of the good news about Jesus that they told and the power of Jesus that delivered this woman from her possession. And next week we're gonna see a glorious display of God's good leading. But it all reminds us that God's ways are higher than our ways. As we climb up that mountain road, laboring hard, feeling like we're going nowhere, that God has a mountaintop ahead and that God is doing something in the midst of all that. He is indeed leading you there with great purpose, with great intention. Our God is a God of providence. He's not a God of, oops, let's fix this, right? God has a plan for your life. And God has redeemed you, if you know Jesus, to be part of that plan. How do you know that God is leading you? In the words of Kimberly Henderson, it's because he didn't pull Jesus off the cross. It's because he didn't pull Jesus off the road that leads to suffering and pain. It's because he didn't pull Jesus off the path that would mean nakedness and beatings, nails and thorns. She writes, you see, if God did that, he'd cheat you and me out of a savior. He'd cheat you and me out of salvation. He'd cheat you and me out of an eternity filled with no more suffering and pain. You can trust God to lead you well because God led his son Jesus, his only son to a cross to redeem you and then out of the tomb to free you from sin and death. Think about that. Meditate on that as we come to the table this morning, the table that reminds us that we can trust God no matter what. 
If you are putting your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, then 